Thank you, Simon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out this, uh, this afternoon. I know the uh, Cape Town traffic can be a bit of a nightmare coming through. I stay in, uh, in Devorakent, and it's only eight kilometers away, but it took me an hour to get here. Uh, so maybe the 400 plus people who are listening in on webcast have got the, uh, the smarter idea. So maybe going forward, you'll just see me on Skype in future, and I'll be sitting at home, and I'll be, uh, I'll be a virtual analyst doing this presentation. Um, this product I send out to my institutional clients beginning of every year. Uh, the underlying stocks are chosen in, in December. I then disseminate down a list to a handful of stocks, which I believe, during the course of the following uh, year, could do quite well in terms of a thematic. So I'm going to run through what I chose uh, this year and give you an update uh, as to what they've done for the first uh, three months of uh, 2017. And uh, if any of them are still very pertinent uh, you know, for, for the remaining six months, or sorry, nine months, I should say. There's your usual disclaimer to keep, me, uh, to keep the wolf from the door and the lawyers from my, from my back. Um, this time last year, um, I said you know, it would be a difficult 2016, um, purely because when I, when I made the stock selection last year, um, in December, many things occurred in late December and January which were completely unfounded or untoward. Uh, we had Nene Gates, we had Gordon Gates, we had Von Royen Gates, etc., etc. The rand was, uh, was like a seesaw. And then, of course, we mustn't forget what Mr. Z Mr. Zuma did during the course of the, uh, the first few months of last year, too. So it was a very choppy performance. And uh, if you weren't in resources in 2016, uh, any, any portfolio purely in industrials, and I'm only an industrial analyst, uh, was, uh, was hampered quite, uh, quite significantly. So the underlying stocks I had last year were all chosen for very valid reasons when I made the selection, which I'll go through. Uh, but uh, the only one that really did me quite well was Signia, uh, which for the second year last year shone. So I thought this year, uh, when I chose my 2017 selection, I would, I would go back to what areas of the economy, in theory, would be immune to any political or extraneous shocks, and which, which key themes uh, in 2017, which I, which I saw, uh, would, would see a, a rebound in certain stocks. And the key theme this year was agriculture and food and the drought. So there's the last, uh, the last uh, five years or so. Um, you know, we all have to have a, a, a bum year. And uh, my 2016 was a, was a pretty poor year. I don't like to, to make losses in anyone's portfolio. And this is a theoretical product of my clients. But uh, the aggregate of the last uh, five years, I've, I've been doing this now for the last seven, uh, has still been fairly good. But uh, I won't dismiss that last year was not my best, uh, my best year. So there was my 2016 selection. As you can see, uh, some were pretty horrific. Tour industries, which I really thought would have a fairly good year. Uh, when I chose it on the back of restructuring, um, increased profits, perhaps a buyout from Stellar Capital was down 50%. Signia was up 38%. A story which I, which I chose last year, purely because a rand had gone uh, to hell in a handcart. And I thought that uh, there'd be good demand for offshore rand hedge diversification in portfolio. Completely reversed in the course of years, a rand strengthened. Now, is there still a need to have a, a rand hedge component in any portfolio uh, you know, for your longer term investments? The, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, but uh, at that point in time, uh, a story looked good at the start of the year, but the end of the year didn't look uh, that, that brilliant. And again, as the indices uh, track there, they are full of resources stocks, and I simply do not cover resources. Uh, so it did, it did hamper me last year uh, because uh, I'm an industrial boy. Uh, there was my 2015 selection, again, a fairly good year. 2014, 2013, 2012, and you'll see a fairly recurring theme. Uh, during during uh, the selections. Many stocks go in and out consistently. So what uh, would, I, would I do uh, in 2017? And again, for, for complete transparency, um, my pension funds are managed by Sandlam, Sandlam Glacier Rep Funds, and in this product, I own CIL and Curro, and I have done for the last uh, five years. I've also owned Carp Agri as well for the last seven years. So uh, not many analysts these days tell you what they own. I publish once a year what I, what I physically invest in for complete honesty. And I think uh, as an analyst, you should put your skin uh, in the game as well, not just to tell your clients to buy the stock. Uh, perhaps uh, more analysts would, uh, would get uh, better uh, performance if their own money was in the game. Oops, I'll go back one. That was me last year, me and Her Majesty. We had a complete annus horribilis. Uh, mine wasn't as bad as Her Majesty's. Uh, we, we, we what she went through back in the day. But uh, for me to make losses uh, is something I really dislike doing. And uh, for me to, uh, to publish on a consistent basis where I've lost money uh, does not sit well. But I'm, I'm, I'm big enough to say I did make a loss and it wasn't a great year. So there was my 2016 selection. I'll do a, a quick rundown uh, as to what exactly went on. Um, 
you know, CIL I'm carrying forward. Why did I drop Signia? here? Because I didn't believe uh, the stock would have another great performance here. Uh, for the last two years, it's been, it's been an outstanding performer from its 840 IPO. And so far this year, the stock's been fairly flat. I didn't put Stella in because I thought it would have a very flat year again. Uh, the, the year of deal making for corporates uh, is over. Uh, the market does not want high growth paper issuing mini conglomerates. They want solid earnings, solid NAV, and companies like Stella and Tor are completely out of favor. Santova was dropped, not because I don't think it's a great company, it's a fantastic little business, but it's, uh, it's a rand, it has rand hedge exposure. And with Brexit and the pound uh, falling in a heap, um, you know, it will have translation uh, 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 earnings problems going forward. But I still like the company. In Astoria, as I said, it was, a, it was a great little listing, very well timed, but the rand has gone against it. You know, when I wrote this last year, the rand at one point was nearly 18 to the dollar. I think this morning we're at 12.50, 12.60. So there was my 2017 selections with the prices as and when I chose them on the 23rd, I think, of December. So why did I choose these stocks specifically and why they're distinct pairings? In many cases, uh, as I said to you, this, is, this product is done for institutional clients. So in many cases, the likes of an Alan Gray, a Metropolitan, a Stanley, a Coronation can't buy a lot of the smaller companies, but they can buy the bigger holding companies. So Carp Agri, as an example, is my main stock uh, in that pairing, but it's an OTC listed stock, and many institutions can't buy OTC listed stocks. So I put Zeda in. Because I thought that Zeda, given that about 8% of Carp Agri is Zeda, would, uh, would perform quite well. And again, Zeda feeds through into my Pioneer Foods selection on, uh, further down, which I'll come to. AEEI and Premier Fishing. When I wrote this, I'd been following Premier Fishing uh, for quite some time. I really liked the company. And at 4.50, I thought it would open at 5.20. It did open at 5.20. I have a 6.50 target. And at some point, the benefit will start flowing through into AEEI which is a main holding company and owns 55% of Premier Fishing. It also announced last week at my small talk conference in Cape Town, it intends to unbundle its technology assets uh, in early 2018, and they believe uh, that that, uh, that that listing alone will be worth 2 billion rand. So the complete look through to AEEI, in theory, uh, once they unbundle their tech assets and you, you then have a market valuation for Premier Fishing, um, they think it's, it's between 6 and 6.50 a share. So I'm hoping at some stage that massive discount to the underlying assets will start to be narrowed as the market suddenly has a complete look-through valuation. Astral and Pioneer, again, I like to put in two very large counters for my, for my, for my clients. And you can't get much bigger in the food space uh, than Astral and Pioneer Foods. Um, that was purely a play, again, on the maize price. Uh, we all knew last year that the drought we've had, particularly in, uh, in the old Transvaal, as I still call it, um, meant that the underlying maize harvest slumped to about 7.8 million tons. And the price on Safex probably doubled last year. At one point, yellow maize and white maize were trading around 5,000 rand a ton. Um, as of this morning, uh, looking forward to the July futures, they're trading below 2,000 rand a ton. So food stocks last year were significantly hampered because their input costs saw a dramatic rise uh, in, the, in the underlying operations, which they simply could not recover from a distressed consumer. So you saw margin erosion, you saw profit falls, and in Astral's case, as the country's largest poultry company, their poultry profits last year fell by 91%. Inside Pioneer Foods, 54% of Pioneer Foods' profits come from essential foods, which is basically um, maize milling, bread, mealy pap, etc., etc. They simply couldn't re uh, recoup uh, the increased cost, and they only saw a 6% rise in profit in that company. CIL, I've put in again, I think for the sixth, for the sixth year. It's been a stock slightly out of favor for the last uh, 12 to 18 months for a combination of reasons. I'm probably one of the very few people um, that's actually been to see the Angolan operations uh, for, my, for, my, for my sin a couple of years ago. Uh, I, do, I don't recommend anybody go to Luanda for a, for a week's holiday. It's not fun and it's terribly expensive when you're spending $10 for a can of Coke and $45 for a Steers burger. But uh, luckily they paid. Uh, CIL is a combination of businesses. It's involved in power infrastructure, uh, building materials. Um, it bought a, a business recently in prepaid meters called Conlog. But its, its choice asset is an oil services business in Angola, which treats oil waste when you drill for oil. The market believes, and it still believes to a certain regard, uh, because I listed this company many, many years ago, that Angola as a country is not doing that well. It's true. Uh, the IMF is helping to bail out the, the, the economy. The economy is not doing that well as, a, as an entity. But the thing the market consistently fails with CIL is for every barrel of oil drilled, waste is produced. Production in Angola has been stable 
or slightly rising. So more waste is produced. If you saw a declining uh, pumping capacity coming from Angola, then you know, CIL would not look so rosy. But we've seen profits from AES, its Angolan operation, rising significantly, six months on six months on six months. There's also concern that it can't get money out of a country. Under Angolan law, if you follow all the rules, you can get your money out in between 30 and 60 days. And in 2016, CIL pulled out 20 million US dollars from Angola. Now, just as, a, as, a, as an aside, they only paid about 20, 22 to 23 million dollars for the company six years ago. And last year, their share was 20 million dollars. They intend to pull out 35 million dollars this year. So it's immensely profitable. Um, there was an offer to buy AES from CIL, one of the Portuguese partners, uh, wanted to do a, a separate spin-off and an unbundling. And uh, if CIL had sold its stake uh, in AES, it would be worth approximately 60% of a comp company's market valuation. Um, last, the last stock is, is ANSYS. Uh, every year I like to put in a small little company, uh, but you wouldn't really put in your granny's portfolio. Uh, but you might put in a, in a speculative portfolio, hoping you know, to, to do quite well. Now, ANSYS is a company that I've been covering privately for a client for about two and a half years. It's predominantly involved in, uh, in, uh, in technology, defense, and telecoms, run by a very uh, smart black entrepreneur called Teddy Decker. He also presented at my conference last week in Cape Town. And this stock, when I first picked it up about two and a half years ago, was trading at 30 cents. It's now at about, a, well, it was around 30 when I, when I, when I did this. I think today it's about, a, about around 28, around 30 as well. Uh, but we did have a good spike when I put it into my top uh, five or my top stocks this year. So I'll, I'll, go, in, I'll go into uh, more of these in the, in the following slides. So that's how we stand at present. I updated these uh, as of this morning before, before, before market opened. So as you can see there, oh, where is this little pointy thing? There we are. Um, as, of, as of this morning, uh, the, top, the top selection was up just over 10%. The benchmark indices was up between 5 and 6%. Um, ANSYS, which has been as high as 170, has, has given back some gains uh, in the last week or so. Otherwise, that 10.5 uh, would have been a bit higher. But I'm very happy that uh, the larger stocks that I put in of CARP, Zeta, Astral, Pioneer uh, have held up quite nicely. Uh, now that Premier Fishing is listed, I'm hoping that AEEI has some benefits. And CIL, um, they're a February interim results period. Which their results should be out in uh, mid-April. Um, I'm hoping that uh, that uh, company will, will start to perk up. And ANSYS, again, having, having, having had a, a good run on the back of my selection, it was up by a third uh, in 10 days. It's given some, uh, some value back. But as Teddy uh, indicated last week of the presentation, uh, his results, which are coming out probably in the next uh, few months, uh, should show con continued meaningful recovery. And on that share price, the stock is trading on a P of 7, based on my estimates. Where are we here? Let me go back. Uh, flip forward. So we'll start off with the, with, the, with the two agricultural themes at the start, was Zeta and Carp Agri. Now, I've been covering these two stocks uh, for a long, long time. Zeta was probably listed, I think, in 2005 or 2006, and Carp Agri is a 100-year-old Western Cape agricultural business. So why have I chosen those two? Uh, for any of you that follow my work, um, I've had ongoing spats uh, with PSG and Zeta for nearly three years. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, it's quite difficult for me to walk down uh, Church Street in Stellenbosch without having a, a bodyguard in case PSG want to uh, try and take me out. Because uh, in Zida's case, I've been harping for them to reduce their performance fees to shareholders, which they've done, and to list Carp Agri, which they've recently allowed to happen as well. So when I wrote this, having followed the stocks very closely, it was my belief uh, back in early December that Carp Agri, uh, following the release of their results uh, for, the, uh, for their uh, September, 2016 year end, which showed a, a very good rise in earnings, there was an intent to list the company. Now, any of, any of you that have invested in OTC stocks in the past, uh, when they move to the main board of a JSC, they generally have a bit of a run. Because the market thinks that uh, you know, the OTC platform isn't exactly very transparent. It isn't easy to deal in, as I was discussing with Simon earlier. If you try to buy Carp Agri shares currently in the OTC, I think you have to fill in 15 pages of forms. And it isn't exactly easy as picking up a phone to your broker and buying 100 shares. It's quite a laborious process. So when I, when I got a whiff that Carp was looking to, to list on the main board of a JSC, it was a no-brainer. The stock at that point was trading at a P of 10. And uh, its main comparative companies, if it were to list on the main board of a JSC, which it confirmed it was doing on the 16th of February at the AGM, would be a cash built on a 20 and a mass mart on a 25. So I thought that based on my earnings forecast for 2017, 
that Carp Agri was worth at least 48 rand a share, and maybe 60 rand by the close uh, of 2017. Uh, as of this morning, uh, it's trading at 44 rand 80. Uh, so it's had a very good run. It's up by 50% since uh, I got whiff of the listing. Now that feeds through into Zeta. So if you can't buy Carp Agri as an institution, you can buy Zeta. Because one thing that Zeta hasn't done consistently in the last couple of years is add value to its shareholders. 75% of Zeta's entire market capitalization is taken up by a stake in Pioneer Foods. And as I discussed earlier, because food companies didn't do well last year, Pioneer Food share price fell, and as such, Zeta didn't go anywhere. So again, the thematic of a, re of a recovery in food companies due to lower input costs, I thought the Pioneer Foods would do well, Carp Agri would list, and as such, Zeta would see a significant uplift in value because the, it, some of the parts would see, would see a nice kicker uh, in terms of share price performance and in terms of earnings. And that's exactly what's happened. As, I, as you saw earlier, Zeta is up uh, to about 7 rand 71, and I think yesterday it hit a new 52 week high. So, can you still buy the two? The answer is yes. Uh, if you can buy Carp Agri, which is currently quite difficult because all the offers in the system have been pulled. Because if you owned Carp Agri, why on earth would you wish to sell it to 44 Rand 80 when you know uh, in, in the middle of this year it's moving its listing to the main board of a JSC and you're probably going to get a significant upward revaluation. Uh, even on the current share price, it's trading on a P of 15 uh, historic, which is still good value compared to its comparatives in the sector. So the way to play Z uh, Carp Agri and Pioneer Foods currently is via Zeta, because Zeta, as of this morning, is trading at about a 10.8% discount to its sum of the parts. So that, uh, that uh, little preamble there gives you a, a, a fair indication as to why I like the stocks and uh, why I think that both companies still have further to go. Oops. AEEI and Premier Fishing. Now, for us living here in the Western Cape, uh, Premier Fishing and AEEI are, are, are homegrown companies. Now, AEEI, uh, based in Waterfront, uh, is the country's most empowered business. In fact, it won the JSE Award last year for being the most empowered company. Uh, the second most empowered company is Oceana Fishing. And uh, as I was discussing with Simon earlier, uh, empowerment is becoming very important in fishing. Moving up to the 2020 reallocation of long-term fishing rights, because the government and uh, the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries wants empowerment to be a critical criteria going forward for transformation of the sector. So up until a few years ago, most of the large uh, allocations of the key species of horse mackerel, hake, anchovies and pilchards went to a small handful of what you could call white-owned fishing companies with tacit black ownership. That's all about to change. And Premier Fishing believes as a, as a, as a wholly owned and wholly black run fishing company is well placed to improve on its current tiny 5% allocation. It does nothing in hake, it does hardly anything in horse mackerel, it has a tiny allocation in pilchards, not much in anchovies, and uh, it's hoping, come up to 2020, that its empowerment credentials will enable it to either get more allocation from the government and or buy out companies that need empowerment credentials to get quota going forward. Um, I put it in because it wasn't listed when I, when I put the stock down. Uh, it only listed on the 2nd of March at 4 and 50. It opened at 5.20. I think, I've, I think this morning it's trading at about 4.75 to 4.80. But AEEI was listed. Now, AEEI used to own 100% of Premier Fishing. It now owns 55%. And as I, as I indicated to you earlier, it also wants to spin off its tech arm. Um, as I put there, the tech arm, they believe, and uh, on, a, on a basic valuation with at least three rand a share. So if you add in all the underlying assets, uh, AEEI, in theory, is worth between 6 and 6.50 a share. And uh, when I chose it, it was trading at 3.70, and I think it's now trading at about 3.90, having been as high as 4.50. Do I still like Premier Fishing on the back of your IPO? The answer is yes. Now, there has been a bit of a, uh, uh, some, uh, some profit taking in the last week since the listing, because Sea Harvest jumped on the bandwagon. And Brimstone, which owns Sea Harvest, is listing uh, the company at the end of this month um, on the main board of a JSE, and is looking to raise 1.5 billion rand. Uh, the Premier Fishing IPO was at uh, 527 million. So one would imagine that uh, if you'd made a, a nice little 15% turn on your Premier Fishing stock, if you managed to get some in the listing, uh, you might uh, take some profit off the table to hopefully replicate that in the Sea Harvest listing. <coughs> Do I still like the company for the longer term? Yes, I've been covering the fishing sector uh, probably now for 17 years. And uh, if you'd invested in Oceana Fishing in the year 2000, uh, you'd have done remarkably well in terms of capital appreciation and even more so in dividends. You know, fishing globally is a, is a finite resource. Catches are aggressively managed. There's growing demand internationally for, uh, for fish, 
And I think any, any fishing company in a, in a well-managed resource, which is what we have here in this country, longer term, uh, particularly for selling uh, in, in foreign currency, even though the rand currently is strong against the dollar and the euro. You know, it's a business that I want to be in longer term. And uh, for funds that want uh, good exposure to a rand hedge stock in, a, in, a, in an area of food, which has long-term growth fundamentals, I still recommend Premier Fishing at the current level. Oop, where are we here? Oop, I've gone too far. I'm far too fast here. There we are. My two large stocks, Astral and Pioneer Foods. Now, I listed Pioneer Foods back in the day in 2007, and uh, I've been involved with Astral Foods probably now for the last 10 years. In fact, I had a very public row with a company a few years ago when we were injecting the chickens full of brine, and I coined the term chicken Botox, uh, which the CEO of the time, Chris Schiller, didn't take too lightly, and I was banned from the company for two years. But uh, I, I like being banned from companies because it means that companies take you seriously, and at some point they have to relent because um, you know, analysts and journalists have far more ink than any company will ever have in their lifetime. Uh, we've now kissed and made up, and I've put uh, Astral and Pioneer into this year's selection for very valid reasons. Again, as I mentioned earlier, due to the maize price. Approximately, roughly, 60% of raising or rearing a chicken is feed. Maize, soya, wheat, vitamins, minerals, etc., etc. So if you saw, as you did last year, the price of maize rising from 2,000 rand a ton to 5,000, and the underlying economy last year being particularly tough, and imports flooding in, it would be very difficult for you to make money, which is exactly what occurred. Astral's um, animal feeds business, which is substantial in its, in, its, in its life, made very good profits. But the chicken side fell by 91%. So as I expected this year, the, the maize harvest to be substantially larger than the market envisaged. Um, I was writing the tail end of last year, but I thought the maize harvest would be as high as 13 to 14 million tons, with a market estimate back in the day uh, was between 10 and 11 million tons. Uh, the reason I could be so confident, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but what I do have is some very good on-the-ground sources in terms of the co-ops that I deal with, particularly Senves, NWK, Carp Agri, etc., etc., were telling me that the on-the-ground farmers in places that I'd never heard of were planting maize on the pavements because they expected to make so much money. And they expected a very good rebound uh, in the maize uh, crop this year due to a combination of reasons, one being very good rain, which, we've, which they've had in Gauteng, or in the Transvaal. And secondly, a little thing called plant population, which I learned uh, last year. Plant population means that if the ground is moist and the seed germinates, you get far more plants uh, in one small area, which means you get a much better yield per hectare. So a combination of good rain and good plant population means that the yield per hectare will, will rise substantially higher than the market anticipates, which is exactly what happened. Uh, the Crop Estimate Committee, uh, I think about two weeks ago, uh, forecast uh, in their second expectation for the year that the maize harvest this year would be uh, between 13 and 14 million tonnes. And as such, the suffix price is continuing to plummet. So Astral uses yellow maize. Pioneer predominantly uses white maize. So if a maize price is going to fall substantially during the course of the year, the input costs to both of these companies will fall, which means there will be margin recovery and profit rebound. And that's why both of these stocks have been running hard so far this year. The market is looking through the short-term problems in astral foods regarding poultry imports, ESCOM cutting off power to certain parts of its plants because the, um, the municipalities aren't paying their bills. But it's all, I call it all white noise. At the end of the day, we all know what's going on regarding imports. We all know what's go going on regarding the economy. But if you as an investor are suddenly seeing dramatic profitability increases in companies, which means the PEs will fall, the share prices in theory will rise. That's exactly what's going on in these two. And both of these stocks, I think, uh, from memory, are up over 20% year to date. Astral I had a target price, I think, about 160. I think it was 160. Uh, it got to 157.98 at one point in the first two weeks uh, of my selection. And Pioneer, uh, I had a target price of 200 Rand. It's trading currently about 177 Rand. And I still think that both of those stocks have got good legs. Um, as the maize harvest starts to be uh, uh, put in the silos and the input costs start to feed through to their bottom line, which would only come uh, due to their year ends uh, in the first half of a new financial year, which is post-September 2017. So both of those stocks are, are favorites of mine. 
and I still think they have, they have more to go. CIL. Uh, again, that stock that I've mentioned I've had in my portfolio consistently for the last five or six years. Uh, last year was the first year in five years. It hasn't given me a good return. And, uh, and year to date, it's probably just off a couple of percentage points. Again, Rail Gams with a CEO uh, presented at my conference in Cape Town last week and gave a very upbeat and stirring um, forecast for his company. Um, you know, so why doesn't the market like the company currently? It's a large rent hedge company. Over 60% of his earnings are Rand Hedge, but currently the Rand is quite strong. So there will be translation um, difficulties going forward. There's issues, uh, the market believes, in repatriating cash from Angola. But I've told you, there's no issues. If you follow the rules, and the oil industry is so pertinent to Angola, um, they actually don't want to annoy their oil companies. So you can get money out. And they have just agreed with about a quarter of their contracts for their, for their, for their, for their dollar-based revenue to be diverted to the Mauritian bank accounts, which is at a much lower tax rates. The real big bugbear has been working capital. Now, this company has been very, very fast growing. And I, and I, I use the same analogy of CIL to Kuro Holdings, which is a company that I've been following again for many, many years. Companies always need cash to grow. They either call in their shareholders for cash in terms of equity, or they borrow money from the banks in terms of debt. But we as investors often want solid earnings and solid dividends. But with a fast-growing company, it's always difficult to get both. So the CEO says, what do you want? If you want dividends and a fairly mediocre earnings profile, fine, I'll just stop growing. Dr. Chris at Kuro said exactly the same thing. If you want dividends, I won't build any more schools. I'll take on no more children, and I'll become a cash cow. But we as a market always want growth. And in CIL's case, for the last five years, it's delivered on average a 16 to 18% rise in HEPs year in, year out. Now, I will take that any day. I want companies in a pension fund or a long-term portfolio which is going to give me rising earnings and at some point a good dividend flow. So CIL currently is delivering very good profits. It's underlying operations in prepaid meters, in oil waste, in power infrastructure, in building materials are all performing well. The market simply does not believe the story. And at some point, as many of us in the room will know if we've been following stocks for a number of years, the market often misprices stories. But at some point, it'll all reverse. And I'm hoping at some stage, with a near 5 billion rand order book, uh, with good earnings growth coming this year, and a solid company, uh, but this company will start to return to norms. And uh, I think the stock currently at just under 23 rand, I think is, is, an, is an underlying bargain. There aren't many companies that I know of which have solid uh, growth tra trajectories in power infrastructure and in oil and gas, both, as we know in this room, long-term areas of, of growth for the globe, which is trading on a P.O. between 7 and 8. And I will take that any day of the week. <coughs> Lastly, a small little company that's at Ansys, a company that I picked up uh, many years ago at, 70, at uh, 30 cents, with its market valuation, I think it was 80 million rand. Uh, when I wrote this, its market valuation was, uh, was 700 million, and it got to a billion rand uh, after I put the stock in the, in the top stock selection. Now, the reason I like stocks like this, uh, it's more of a private client stock or a, or a, or a certain boutique investor uh, asset class, because it's so small and so misunderstood, and the liquidity can be a bit of an issue. But institutional investors either haven't heard of it, they can't invest in it because it's too small, and if they wanted to buy a meaningful allocation of stock, they simply couldn't. So when I was doing the roadshow to my clients at the beginning of this year, and I, and I always try and, you know, institutions feel they cover everything. And they feel they know every stock in the marketplace. And I say, well, have you heard of Ansys? Hmm, no, what do they do? And you say, this, this little company has gone from 30 cents to around 30. It's moved from a hefty loss to a hefty profit. Uh, it's got great empowerment credentials. And it's doing some, some very good works with Transnet and with uh, fiber optic telecoms, et cetera, et cetera, they start to prick up their ears. And uh, I'm forecasting earnings this year to March of 17 cents, and 17 cents and around 30 gives you P of around 7. Now, when the CEO and the chairman were at my conference last week, and they were still very confident of a very good growth trajectory going forward. Now, I'm not quite sure where you all live in Cape Town, but where I stay in Greenpoint, they're digging up the streets, putting in fiber optic cable uh, for all the internet. And uh, they are involved in that. They, do, they don't dig up the streets, thankfully. But they're involved, in, they're involved in supplying all the connectivity, the bits and bobs, and the back-end services to, to telecom companies that are digging up our streets. 
And I think the streets will be dug up in Cape Town and in Bloemfontein and PE and Durban and Joburg for quite some years to come. So they think that that business, which is currently their largest, has many years of growth to come. They also have a, they also have a good track record in, uh, in discovering and patenting license, licenses for new technology. And I'll give you one classic example. Uh, one of my clients in Johannesburg got the, got, got the idea. Um, Discovery Insurance, uh, probably a, a good six to 12 months ago, were advertising a product that if you uh, fit a little box inside your car, Discovery Insurance would see how well that you were driving. If you were speeding, uh, if you were a responsible driver, et cetera, et cetera, and you would get much lower premiums. Uh, I don't think it would really work in Cape Town because we all don't drive that well. Uh, I'm from Joburg, so we do. Uh, but it was ANSYS that, that developed that technology for discovery, and they got, a, they got a royalty on the back of that product. So they took an old defense tracking technology, they re-engineered it for, for a modern world environment, and they're now, they're now getting a kickback from discovery for, for this, this product, as one example of using an old defense-based defense -based technology in the real world. The key area of growth is tracking. Now, Transnet wants to know, and, uh, and Sasa, and oh, no, Sasa, I'll take that back, and uh, the, the rail agency, uh, wants to know where all its vehicles are, its trains, its points, its trucks, etc., etc. So, so ANSYS has, has developed a little tracking device that goes on every single piece of rolling stock. So they, that they know where anything is at any one point in time. Because the last thing you want as a rail authority is a derailment, is a point actually working. Well, that train should have been there, but it's actually there. So they're actually becoming a little bit more um, responsible in, in managing the network. So that's a, a nice little product of theirs too. The other key area of this company is mine safety and mine technology. Now we all know, uh, given what's going on in the mining industry, that safety and fatalities is a significant area of government concern. You know, there aren't many weeks that go by without, without hearing of, of some issue at some mining company. So what they have done is they've developed specific technology uh, which they're selling to mining companies to try and mitigate mine accidents going forward by <coughs> tracking where workers are in the mine. If there's gas in the mine, they put little sensors in the shafts to, to try and detect uh, a rock fall or a rock blowout. They put sensors on the, on the shaft ropes to see if there's going to be fatality or, or, a, or a, some form of denigration of a rope. And that's also uh, uh, going quite well because health and safety in the mining industry is, uh, is a very pertinent area. Uh, in South Africa these days, because otherwise you get shut down. So the stock, as I said, has gone from around 30, sorry, it's gone from 30 cents to around 30. It got to a high of 170 a few weeks ago, and it's now back to 128. I'm still fairly confident that uh, my earnings forecast there will be made, and I think in the middle of May, when uh, Teddy Decker is back in Cape Town doing a presentation, uh, a few more people will be at his, uh, his results than were at the last results. So I think only three of us turned up at his, his last results presentation in Cape Town. And I like stocks like that. Stocks where nobody has heard of them. Where you think, what do they do? Who are these, who are these little company? But you can, you can pick up these little gems, and is it gonna make you a fortune? Maybe not. But from 30 cents to around 30, and I think it's worth 225, it's a stock that I would put in a portfolio as a, as a, as a speculative play on, on prospects and institutions picking the stock up and saying, you know what, we'll have a look at this. And there's only one institutional investor currently in the stock, which is Investec, because it's too small for most people. So that's the, my little spec play. And then Kuro I left out, uh, not because I don't like the stock. I like the stock a great deal. It's the second largest stock in my pension fund. Um, but I've been covering the stock for many, many years. And uh, when I looked at this, it was trading at about 48 rand. And I didn't think the stock would have a, would have a, would have a great year. Um, it's doing really well. Uh, but, you know, the stock had a very good run last year and the year before, and I didn't think this year would have, would, would have much of a share price performance, and so far it's been fairly flat. Uh, Dr. Chris van der Merwe had his results in Cape Town two weeks ago, and they were startling results. Great, great numbers coming out. But, you know, it's probably in the price. It's a stock that I own, I probably wouldn't want to sell. Uh, but uh, I left it out because I didn't think in this, in this product it would give me the capital appreciation that I, that I needed. And I have a, a little product for my clients called Black Book. And I'm an old-fashioned analyst. I can't use iPads or laptops because I tend to lose them or break them. Uh, so I write things in, in little, little leather arch files and little, little black books. And I publish that on a consistent basis. So what did, I let, what did I leave out this year and why? One stock that I'm very fond of is Rolfs. They had their results a couple of weeks ago, interim results, which are up 34%. They also were at my conference last week. And that company has been the best performing small cap stock of the last 12 months. It's doubled. So when a stock has doubled, um, I really couldn't put it in. Uh, it was trading at about uh, 
five rand when I, when I looked at it. It's at 570, I think I wrote a note yesterday, it was five, at 577, uh, getting near to my six rand 50 target. So I thought most of the easy money had been made. Uh, I left 10 bears out because at that stage, um, the real impact of a, of a maze benefit and a maze recovery hadn't been factored into its underlying valuation. It has now. Senves is one of the largest companies you've probably never heard of. It's a vast titan uh, in the agricultural field based in Clarksdorp. Uh, turnover of over 10 billion rand. It makes probably half a billion rand in operating profit. Uh, and it's a giant in the space of grain trading, grain handling, et cetera, et cetera. And as a tidbit, many years ago, they used to own Heinz, and then they sold it to Pioneer Foods. So it's a very large business, but it was, it was substantially impacted in the last couple of years by the drought, which saw material earnings fall because it makes most of its money from moving and handling grains. And if a crop was low, then they don't make much money. But the crop this year is bouncing back to 13 to 14 million tonnes. So I'm expecting a real bounce back in Senvers' earnings this year. And uh, when I wrote this, it was trading at about 10 rand 40. It's at 10 rand 50 currently on the ZARX. Perhaps I shouldn't say that being as the, we are sitting at the JSE. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cheap platform for Senmez to list on uh, because they're farmers, and farmers are quite mean with money. So they went to the ZARX purely just to save a few bucks. But at 10 rand 50, if they earn what I think they're going to earn this year, which is probably about a rand 20, the stock's trading on a P of probably 7.5, 8, and is trading currently at a discount to its net asset value of about 9% and pays very, very good dividends. Solid, conservative, cash in the bank company. Anchor was a stock that I've been covering for many, many years. Um, it listed at 2 rand about three years ago. It got to a high of 18 rand 80, and since then it's slumped. I think uh, its current share price is around 7 rand 40. So, as I said to Simon on the, on the way in, um, it's a stock that I personally have invested in it at, uh, uh, at, at IPO, and I probably wouldn't sell it. Uh, firstly, because the, the CEO uh, is my former boss when he was uh, uh, at Nedbank, and I was his head of sales, and he was the head of industrials, and I think he's a very smart guy. Uh, he's got great marketing, but the market currently does not rate asset management companies very highly because the market last year was very problematic. Um, asset inflows into unit trusts and, uh, and other, other products, you generally had an outflow. And, uh, but Anchor had an inflow. But uh, the market just didn't like the company. Its Capricorn hedge fund business had a terrible 2016. Uh, its earnings have been uh, consistently cut. And I think its trading updates recently, we, it's looking at, at reporting about 60 cents a share. Uh, it's high at some point in 2016 was a rand. So the stock has significantly derated. Uh, so I didn't put it in because I didn't think the market uh, would, uh, would, would value the company as I value it this year. Uh, and I've been right. It's fallen from about 10 rand 60 when I looked at this and it's now trading at, at 7.40. Uh, do I like the company? Yes, I do. Do I think at some point it'll recover? Yes, I think, I think it will. But the question is when. And I think we need another good uh, set of results, which may only come in 2018, if the 2017 financial year, uh, in terms of market performance, kicks back. Uh, so that's why I left it out. Uh, there's my thank you. There's my Twitter page, Small Talk Daily. Uh, for, all, for those who want to follow me, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite colourful. I get into terrible trouble at times uh, from, uh, from telling people what I think. But an analyst in today's modern world has to have an opinion. And many analysts at uh, the larger houses these days are too scared to tell you anything uh, due to compliance, banking relationships, et cetera, et cetera. I have no affiliation. I work for Vinali Securities, and we are a completely independent uh, securities stockbroker. And as such, I have the freedom and, uh, and the flexibility to say exactly what I like and I do. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.